Welcome to Better Bachelor. My name is Joker with a face for radio and a voice for print. Uh, we're going to jump right into it today. I want to talk to you guys about uh, the key to being rich, staying single. Now, I, I, you can do this if you're married. You can do this if you have a girlfriend. But to be honest with you, I've found that most of the time when I was in a relationship, when I was married, the savings came few and far between. Um, now, maybe if she's on the same page and really serious about it, then you can probably, you might be able to manage that okay. But the reason why it uh, it's always tougher when you have, you're in a relationship is let's face it, she wants anniversary gifts, she wants Valentine's Day gifts, she wants birthday presents, she wants vacation, she wants dinner out at a nice restaurant once or twice a month. There's always something that can come up and kind of push things back a little bit. And as a guy, especially if you're the earner of the family, what happens is you're, you're put in a pretty tough place. You need to keep her happy and, and keep the money rolling to do certain events with her. Everything is twice as expensive. And let's face it, many times, especially if you look at the divorce rates, 60% of, of uh, 60 to, well, 80% of marriages are filed, or the divorces, excuse me, are filed by the women. And a lot of times they take half the resources. So instantly uh, you can be you can be the main earner, but you're going to lose half of that income. And this is something I found out um, through my relationships. I, I got lucky and didn't lose my shirt in the divorce because I didn't have that much at the time when I got divorced. But as you, as you age, uh, you need to be aware of financing. Now, uh, I'm going to go, this is going to be a video about finances and money and um, ways you can you, no matter what age you are, uh, you can start investing. You can start putting your money to where you'll you'll do much better for yourself. And I don't know who said it, but it was once famously said that if you have to work for your money, you're never going to become rich. Only when your money is making you money is, is when you're rich. So a good example of that is let's say you had a million dollars in the stock market and uh, you decide to put that in something that's going to give you a two or 3% dividend yield. Plus it's a growth stock that maybe gets 10% returns every year. That $1 million will be making you a hundred to $120,000 per year on top of the money you actually work for. The younger you get started in this, the better off it's going to be. So we're going to talk about compound interest. I'm going to talk about dividend yields and investing and uh, why that will help you. But I started late. I started late compared to everybody else because, again, I had been married. I got divorced. Um, I was doing a, a, a lot of different things with my life, and none of it was very smart with money. And I've learned this now over the last 10 years, and I want to give you guys a little bit of a leg up. So no matter where you are, you can look at this as a different angle. Uh, before we get started on that, I do want to mention YouTube is now censoring live streams that are becoming too popular, uh, meaning that people that are going up the, the Ottawa convoy, uh, truckers convoy in Canada, as well as the Alberta one that a lot of people are not getting coverage of, uh, they have said no to mainstream media, that they're not taking interviews, they're not allowing them in, they're shutting legacy media out, and they're only letting YouTubers and live streamers and Rebel News and smaller creators um, do the, the live streams. And so YouTube's answer to this is, well, let's remove these streams because we don't want people to see go, uh, what's going on. So today's sponsor, it's about a, a minute and a half. Please l give it a listen. It's very important. Today's sponsor is me. Guys, the censorship is in full force, whether it's Twitter uh, removing certain uh, presidents or other people, whether it's uh, Facebook that is removing now the trucker convoy and other um, pages that are trying to set up events, um, whether it's here on, on YouTube, um, they're, YouTube's dying. Like any, any unique, interesting content that goes against the narrative is being removed. As you can see, my content now is pretty much uh, been confirmed not suitable for most advertisers. So even though you watch an ad, YouTube keeps all the money. I don't get any of it. And they're also marking it as 18 older and up. Even, again, even though my content obviously isn't 18 and up, and what this does to the videos is you can see here, it drops it down to nothing when they mark it this way. I put an appeal and they removed it and it jumped, started jumping back up and then they put it back in place again. And I'm, now I'm back to nothing. So a lot of the content that you're looking for, um, whether it's from me or other content creators, just isn't here on YouTube or, or you're not being offered it. The number one place where all my content is gonna go is locals and everything getting is getting mirrored over to Rumble. YouTube is going to be the kind of the same old, same old for me. I can't do many new topics. I can't talk about certain things. 
and uh, YouTube just won't allow it anymore. So YouTube is going to be the least of my content. I'll still put it up here when I can. Uh, but going forward, if you want to find all my content and all the stuff that probably really matters in society today, join me over on Rumble. Join me over on betterbachelor.locals.com where you can support me for 13 cents a day. You can take part in the forums, completely 100% free speech forums because I am the moderator over there. I'm the only moderator and I don't moderate. I pretty much let anybody talk about anything, including things that the community may not like because uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Uh, guys, thanks for making it through that. I appreciate you listening to it. Um, YouTube is is now uh, uh, kind of shutting me down. Most of my content's going to be over on Rumble and Locals now. And what you get to see here is probably going to be uh, the least interesting of my of my stuff because that's just the way it is now. All right, let's talk about rice uh, and the chessboard story and the power of exponential growth. Um, this isn't a very long read, but I, I want you to kind of get an idea of how powerful investing when you're younger is versus when you're older. And also that if you say, hey, you know what, it, I'm, uh, when I go out on dates or I go out to the pub or I go out to the bar or I buy a couple of new video games, it's only costing me $50 a month or $100 a month or $200 a month. It's not very much. I want you to see what that money could do for you so that when you get to be my age, which is around 50, maybe even younger, maybe a little bit older, you'll have it. Not only will you be extremely successful, you'll literally be on easy street. So this is a story uh, um, says here, uh, there was once a king in India who was a big chess enthusiast and had the habit of challenging wise visitors to a game of chess. One day, a, a traveling sage was challenged by the king. The sage, having played this game all his life, all the time with people all over the world, gladly accepted the king's challenge. To motivate his, his opponent, the king offered any reward the sage could name. The sage modestly asked for just a few grains of rice in the following manner. The king was to put a single grain of rice on the first chess square and double it on every consequent one. The king accepted the sage's request. Now, for those of you that don't play chess, um, I'm, I'm rated, depending how long it's been, I, I'm, I'm between a 1,400 and 1,600 player, depending on how long I get back into it and how uh, what the time constraints are on the game. So I'm pretty familiar with it. Well, it's an 8 by 8 grid. There's 64 spots on there. So that's 64 doublings of a single grain of rice. Uh, that And it doesn't sound like much. Again, one grain of rice and doubling it every square it doesn't, doesn't sound like a ton. But they say, having lost the game and being a man of his word, the king ordered a bag of rice to be brought to the chessboard. He then started placing grains of rice according to the arrangement. One grain on the first square, two on the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth, 16 on the next, so on and so forth. Following the exponential growth of the rice payment, the king quickly realized that he was unable to fulfill his promise because on the 20th square, the king would have had to put 1 million grains of rice. On the 40th square, the king would have had to put 1 billion grains of rice. And finally, on the 64th square, the king would have had to put more than um, an 18 with a lot of zeros, <laughs> grains of rice, which is equal to about 210 billion tons and is allegedly sufficient to cover the whole territory of India with a meter thick layer of rice. If you guys ever played the, if you guys ever played the game um, Outbreak, I think it's called Outbreak. Uh, is that it? Anyway, it's, it's where uh, you can create a virus and it'll double and double and double and double. And what happens from that is that uh, near the ending of the game, I mean, the, the map just goes in huge chunks. And so uh, in this story here, they say on the 20th square, he would have had to put a million grains of rice, the 21st, 2 million, the 23rd, uh, 20 second, 4 million, the 23rd, and that's how that works. So that's compound. It's making your money work for you. Now, you're never going to double your money in anything unless you got in very early into crypto, which I fortunately did, which was my, that was my saving grace. And that was my catch up to not investing well for the first uh, 20 or 30 years of my life. But let's look at some averages here. Let's get an idea of, of what it means to invest earlier rather than later. And I'm not going to tell you any individual stocks, but I want to. I just want to get this concept in your mind so you can understand, hey, this is what I need to look into no matter how old I am because that's going to be what, what takes you farther in life. They say, what is the average stock market return? The average stock market is historically 10% annually 
before inflation. Stock market returns vary greatly, however. Now, depending on where you live, maybe uh, the same stock market isn't available. But now with computer technology, you can invest in all sorts of, of foreign stocks and you do have that available to you in many areas. Not all areas, but in many. And what this allows you to do is get your money into something that historically grows at a pretty average rate. Now, if you're into the stock market, obviously, if you're older, you have to be like very old, like my parent, my mother's age, my parents' age uh, before my father passed. Um, they, they couldn't be in stocks because if the stock market fell off and it took five, seven, 10 years to come back, they, they wouldn't have been able to pull out that money without incurring a large loss because some years the stock market drops 30, some years it increases 30. But when you look at the overall trend of the stock market across the years, even in more modern times, like from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, until today, you're still going to average about 10% return. Um, and, and I'm not going to read down through the story, but I wanted you to see from, you know, this is from investing at nerdwallet.com. I wanted you to see what they were saying about the stock market, not me, because again, I'm just an idiot on a video camera. So let's talk about compound interest. Uh, let's say you start with an initial balance. Let me zoom this up a little bit here so you guys can see a bit better. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do this in U.S. dollars just because I'm in the U.S., but it works the same for any currency. Let's start. Let's say you're, you're a, a, a person today starting with zero dollars. We put in the interest rate, which is 10% yearly, which, again, is what they were talking about historically with the, um, with the stock market. And let's say you're 20 years old and you want to retire at 65. We're just going to make a round number. That would be 45 years in the market. We're going to compound the uh, interest quarterly because that's, uh, well, we could, I mean, we'll do it yearly or quarterly, but I'm going to go to quarterly because that's when dividends usually are paid out. We'll talk about dividends in just a minute. And we're going to do $2,000 a month, and we're just going to do $50 a month. Okay, for many of you guys, that might be a date. For some of you guys, that might be a video game or a couple used video games. Uh, it might be going out to the movies and having drinks with friends. That's all we're gonna. That's all we're gonna start talking about is a fifty dollar monthly deposit. Deposit made at what point in the period? Well, we said the beginning of. We'll say the beginning of the pay period, which means that if you're paid at the end of the month, you'll put it in on the very first of the next month, and increase your deposits yearly with inflation. Which means if there's ten percent inflation you're going to increase your payment from 50 up to $52.50. If there's 10% inflation, you'll go from 50 one year to 55 the next year. Okay, so inflation goes up. We're, we're gonna hope that your income and your salary continues to go up at about the same rate. If it's not, it's time for you to look for a different job. And I put in here annual inflation rate of 5% because, because right now rates are really high. Now, normally it's about 2.53%, but I put in 5%. Let's hit the calculate on that. And so if you started at 20 years old with $50 a month, by the time you're $65, you'll notice your future investment value is almost $900,000. All you've put in is $95,000. But the interest earned is $800,000. That's you making $800,000 for free. All you did is have to put the money in over the years and from 20 to the age of 45, you only put in 95,000. It sounds like a lot until you break that down across 45 years. What does that come to? $50 a month plus inflation. You'll almost be a millionaire just based on the interest of the money. That's just the stock market growing. Now, that again, you have to put in a little bit more based on inflation, but that's only a total of 95,000. Now, let's say that you're let's say that you're going to be um, 30 years old. When we're just going to play with the numbers and you want to retire at 65, that's 35 years. We'll leave everything else the same and let's calculate it. Now you notice you've only put in 54,000, but you've made quarter of a million. So you're still getting a lot of free money. You put in 50,000, you get $250,000 of free money. Okay. Sounds good. But remember, as inflation continues to go up, that 250,000 may only be worth 100,000 today. The million may only be worth 600,000, $500,000 of today. So even though they're pretty big numbers, they may not be quite as big as you're hoping they are. But you can still see for your 50,000, you got paid 250,000 and your total investment is 300,000. It's literally free money. 
Now let's go in here and say that you are Joker's age when he started. I started at about 40 years old, okay? Um, if I did the same 50 bucks a year, or excuse me, 50 bucks a month, you'll notice that it's 72,000 total, total interest earns 400, wait, was that? No, I did that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm 40, so if I wanna retire at, at, at uh, 65, that means I only have 25 years of compounding interest. No wonder those numbers looked weird. And now you notice my deposits are only 28,000 and I've only made 70,000, which means my future investment value is only 100 grand. So let's, let's look at, at how much that doubling of the rice means. If we go here, all the way back to the beginning, and let's say we're gonna invest for 40 years, okay? And we, we say everything else is the same. If you invest for 40 years, um, something, is that right? Why does that seem low? I, did I do something wrong? No, I guess that's right. Okay, so uh, at 40 years, you put in 72,000, and interest, you got 456. But let's remember the total value, 528,000. It's $528,000, okay? So 528, and if you invest for just one more year, instead of 40 years, you invest for 41. Instead of 528, instead you would make 588. In that last year, 528, you invested $4,000 more but you made $60,000 more. This is the power of exponential growth. The longer it's there, the better it's going to work out for you. And I'll give you a really good real world example. When I was, well, how old was I? I think I was around 28 when I got married. My parents gifted me 100 shares of a stock and it paid a dividend. And what that dividend is, is that is the company that says, we're going to pay part of what the company makes to you, our investor. We're going to pay a certain percentage of that. And, and I'll get in a little deeper on that. And so let's say on those 100 shares, let's say they were worth $10 each, okay? Uh, that would be $1,000 worth of stocks. Well, if they pay me back 2%, that means I, the next year would be $1,020 value of stock if I use that 2% and repurchase more stock with it. Doesn't sound like much. It's only 20 bucks but I was given 100 shares of stock when I was 28 years old. I just looked at the stock and the amount of stock that I have now at almost 50 years old, and I now have 2,400 shares of that stock. Now it pays higher, a, a higher dividend than 2%, but my parents set it up to buy more shares of the stock with a dividend. And so over the years, it, it bought more stock, which means that I got more dividend yield, which means that I bought more stock. And I bought more uh, using, which I got more dividend yield, which bought even more stock. And so now in the latest years, instead of just buying, you know, uh, maybe one or two shares of the stock, every, every year it's buying 60 or 100 shares of the stock. That's the, the compound interest of this. So now let's say that you're my age. Let's say that you're 50 years old and you want to retire at 65. So that would be 15 years of investing. Well, I obviously I can't do a fifty dollars a month because if I did, if I only did fifty dollars a month, I'd I'd only have twenty seven thousand dollars. I'd have put in twelve. I'd I'd, I'd have put in twelve thousand dollars, and I'd only earn fourteen thousand. So my total would be twenty seven thousand. You can't retire on that. So if I, at fifty you decide to start this and you're only putting fifty dollars a month, the same amount the eighteen year old started with, by the time both of you get to retirement age the 18 year old or the 20 year old put in $50 a month forever, he's a millionaire. The guy that started at 50 and invested till 65, he's got 25 grand, can't even buy a new car with it. So how much catch up money, how much money do you need to put in to catch up to where the young person was? Well, let's put in $2,000 a month deposit starting at the age of uh, 40 and you wanna, or excuse me, at 50 and you wanna retire at 65. There it is future investment value of a million dollars in those 15 years. So if you start as a, an 18 year old or a 20 year old putting $50 a month in, just increasing for inflation until you retire, you're a millionaire. If you wanna start later in life, you have to put $2,000 a month in from the age of 50 to 65 
to equal the same amount. And you notice here, that means that I will have deposited half a million dollars to earn half a million dollars. So it's on, you're only getting about doubling your money. However, if you again, start at 20 and go to 65 for 45 years of retirement, let's even do uh, 47 years of retirement. Let's say you started this at 18 and you, and you only put in 50 bucks a month. Okay, we'll go back to the 18 year old. I'm a millionaire if I put in $2,000 a month. That young person doing 50 is also a millionaire, but, I, but they only deposited a hundred grand to make a million to make, and their total value is 1.1 million. So the younger person only pays into it a hundred thousand, but gets almost a million back where the older person puts in half a million to get half a million back. Now let's say you're a successful young man. Let's say that, hey, you know what? Uh, let's take a middle-aged range, okay? Let's say 35 years. So you're 35 years old. You can only invest for 30 years until retirement at 65. And instead of, of let's say things are going pretty well for you. And instead of making a car purchase, let's say a new car would cost you or a lease or whatever, might cost you $300 a month or 350 or 400. The average price car now, I think costs you about $400 a month. So let's do $400 a month. And instead of buying that new car, you just keep driving that ratty, ratty old car until you can buy another one in cash. And so you keep kind of going from older vehicle to older vehicle, or you have a new one you've paid off and you hold on to that for 20 years. Let's calculate that out. Wow, you put in, you'll have 300,000 in deposits at, at 35 years old. Did I do that for 35? Yeah, as a 35 year old man, if you put that $400 a month away, you'll have put in 300,000 into the stock market or other investment device and your total interest earned is a million and you'll be worth 1.4. And just for fun, let's say you're that young guy. He's 18 years old He's um, and he wants to work for 47 years. And let's say you're, you're doing okay with money. You're living at home, you're living with a roommate and you can do $400 a month. And I know for a lot of you guys, that are 18, you're like, dude, I cannot do that. But let's just, I wanna get this idea in your head. Let's say you do $400 a month, okay? How much will you have by the time you're 65? You'll have $8.8 .8 $8 dollars. You'll have put in 800,000, but you'll to your total earnings will be $8 million. So for those of you guys that are truckers, welders, carpenters, uh, plumbers, the working guys that come out of high school, that go right into a blue collar job, a trucker, whatever, and you go right into a blue collar job, instead of getting that fancy 100, 200, $250,000 degree, those payments on, on the loan for those school loans are four or $500 a month with the fact that the interest rate is, is high enough on them that it's gonna take you 10 or 20 years to pay off. So the snooty, you know, the snooty people that are making fun of you for being a blue collar job, what if you worked and you worked a little overtime? What if you, what if you uh, put in that extra time? What if you worked a part-time job? What if you worked a part-time job? Let's say you make a part-time job at 10 bucks an hour and you work 10 hours a week, right? Times four a week, that's 40 hours at $10 an hour. You know, that's close to 400 minus taxes and everything else. Let's say that you, you don't have that, you know, fancy car that you make the payments on. Let's say that you can, you go an extra year or two on the video card that you really wanted, uh, but you hold off until the price drops. Instead of buying a video game the day it releases, you wait a year or two. I'm still playing Skyrim. The thing was delete, re released 10 years ago. Still a fun game. The graphics aren't quite as cutting edge. So th this is, that's the stock market. The same thing in, is crypto. Now, crypto has increased much faster, but it's also much more volatile, okay, where, where the stock market gets you pretty regular 10% over the years. So if you're investing for 20, 30, 40 years, you're likely to be at 10%. The stock market, or excuse me, crypto, you can get in, you know, when it's maybe 35,000 like Bitcoin is, it might rocket up to 65, it might drop down to 45, it might, for long-term, maybe you're okay with that. For short-term, you're okay with that. But I would say to be careful because if you invest something you don't want to lose, or if you want to invest something that you're not okay with losing, go with the steady Freddy, something like the stock market um, or, or similar investment, whether it's in the 
overseas in Europe or in Asia or anything like that. But if, you, if you're a little bit older like me and you have some money that you say, I don't want to lose this, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm okay if I do because I'm still working and I've, I've still got other investments that are doing well. Like say, for example, you've got that million dollars in the, st in the stock market and you're getting 10% a year on that, that's $100,000. But let's say you only needed $30,000. You could take that 70,000 and put it into crypto. If you lose it, no big deal. You're gonna get it again the next year and you didn't even work for that money. That's money the stock market gave you. So if you lose it, no big deal. But if, but if crypto takes off or something else takes off like it, you could end up doubling or tripling or quadrupling that money. That's how I caught up in the game is I started getting in, into um, uh, the Bitcoin when it was probably, I think 600 to $1,500 per. Now, whether it's 30,000 or 60,000, I'm way ahead. And it doesn't mean that you're too late to get in now, but it just means you gotta be careful when you do so, especially if you're younger, because you're guaranteed, almost guaranteed a return in the stock market over a long enough period of time. That's why I say stock market for those of you that are maybe 40 and younger is still the best way to go. For those that are a little bit older, but do have some disposable money, if you wanna to try to play catch up, crypto is a bit of a gamble, but you could try it. And lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, dividend and I pulled up McDonald's. Um, McDonald's doesn't always pay, but many companies like IBM, uh, banking companies oftentimes do, utility companies do. But I pulled up McDonald's because almost everybody knows McDonald's. And if we look at their growth, even in 2013 here, okay, so we're going back about 10 years, they were $100 per share. Now you go forward to today, and you can see even here, I, um, it, it did have a pretty big drop off where it went from 217 per share. And just in a matter of a couple of months here, let's see if I can find the, it bounced down to about 150. So if you went, oh man, I was at 220 and it dropped to 150, uh, what am I gonna do? You just wait. And you can see back over time, it goes all the way up. Now it's sitting at 250. So over 10 years, if you put in $100, you now have $250. If you put in $10,000, you now have 25,000. If you put in a hundred grand, you have 250,000. And all you had to do is just sit and wait. And yes, there were some up and downs. That's the peaks and valleys here. But the important thing that I wanted to talk about is dividend. And what dividends are, okay, is right now, the, the dividend yield is 2.13%. And so what that is, is no matter what the stock price does, like if, you, if the stock price is $100 and it drops to $60 and then it jumps up to $140, depending on when you get out, um, you, you're gonna get penalized. You may be selling for less than you bought it for or more than you bought it for. But the annual dividend is $5.52, which means for every share of McDonald's you own, for every $250 current price you have in McDonald's, they're gonna give you $5 just for owning the stock. It doesn't sound like much. And for many, many people, they just say, ah, not even worth it. But what happens when you have that $5 that they pay you for your one share of stock and you have it buy a little bit more stock? Now, instead of having one share, you have 1.02 shares of McDonald's. And then next year, it's not gonna be 1.04, it's gonna be 1.04 and another little fraction because the 2%, 2 the $5 you reinvested is now also gaining that money. And that's compound, that's the compounding. So when I got a stock, um, and I'll, I'll use another example, uh, let me think. There's Duke Power, Duke Energy. That's a stock I used to have, um, I used to have some stock in. And I'm not recommending any of these just so you know. I'm just using this as an example. Um, that if we if we look here, we can look at the um, the quote summary, and let's see if that shows our graph. And here's the here's the max range on it. And again, if you look at this on a a weekly or even yearly, you might have some disappointment. What if you, in 2015 you got in, and it's uh, 87 a share, and then in 2016 you're looking and you say, oh, it's only 65. I've lost 25, 30 percent of the stock. That's not the way to view this. You always look at the long-term trends. And if you look at the long-term trends, again, even if you got in at a peak in 2015, the most expensive it had been yet at 87, you didn't see that price again until three years later in 2018. But if you just stayed with it and stayed patient, 
Now you'd be up to over 100, 102, even if you bought in in 87. Now, again, that's only a 13% gain, roughly 13% gain, which doesn't sound great. That's why you spread your purchases amongst many different stocks. So you might say, I want three or four companies that are computer. I want three or four that are food. I want three or four that are medicine. I want three, and you spread all your portfolio out. So in the end, you might have 20 or 30% um, or 20 or 30 different stocks, all in different segments of the economy. That way, when one falls off, another one will hopefully be doing better, or maybe there's a, a recession or a fallback and all of them fall. Well, what happens when they all fall? You, you, you just hold firm, just wait. Because again, the market, market is cyclical. One year, it may, all of them may lose 30%. That's called going into a recession. And then over time, they come back. So what many people did is in 2008, and this is why you always keep a little bit of capital to the side. You want to have savings, you want to have your investment. And, and maybe that savings isn't much, maybe that investment isn't much, but you've got to start somewhere, even if it's $50 a month for each or $100 a month for each, because the younger you are, the farther that'll take you. But see, a lot of people don't realize that. So if we look at the, um, if we look at the dividend history on this one, this one is a 3.81% dividend yield, which means just for holding the stock year after year, you will be making 3% of the money back. And if the, if the market falls, yeah, you might lose 20% when the, the prices fall down 20%, but you only lost 17% because the company's given you 3% for owning it. And so what happens is that dividend yield, you can also compound, but instead of having that turn into cash for you and be held in an account. When you're younger, you have that rollover and buy even more shares of the company. And then over the years, if you, again, the younger you start, the more you have. Then over the years, your $100 or your 100 shares of stock turn into 150, turn into 200, turn into three. And if then 30 years on or 20 years on, then all of a sudden you look and you go, it's 2,200 shares that the next year is turning into 2250, 23, 24, and it keeps going. So when, when the earlier you get started in this, and it's not too late even if you're my age, because when you get older, like when you get to be my age, and you go back to this compound interest right here, when you get to be my age, and maybe you only have 10 years left until you retire, okay? You're, it's going to be, you're not going to have nearly the same advantage, but let's say that you're doing really well for yourself. You're a single guy and you have $3,000 a month left over. Well, what happens is you, you're, you're putting away half a million dollars. Yeah. But you're still getting a free $300,000. That's nothing to sneeze at for 10 years of investing. You're just going to have to put a lot more in at the end of it. So guys, I, I hope this kind of gives you something to think about. There are books out there on how to invest. Um, if anybody advises you of a specific stock, a specific investment, a specific thing, be leery of that. Be leery of that because really it's you're, you're kind of spreading your seeds across the entire growth of the stock market in general. There's ETFs, which are equity trade funds. I think that stands for equity trades funds, where each ETF that you purchase might be a balloon of 20 or 30 stocks in certain segments. Um, I hope I'm accurate on that. It's been so long since I've, uh, ETF funds, let's see what it says. Uh, exchange traded funds. Good thing I, I checked, see? This is why you don't listen to me for specific investing advice because I'm stupid. But what you can do here is you can even go in and find a certain fund and purchase those as well and that fund will have energy stocks, consumer staples. Uh, I, this is probably hard for you guys to see. You can purchase like if, you, if this Invesco fund, this focuses on uh, energy and the number of ETFs is 69. 69 of them, 69. But when you look in there, you'll see here's all the stock companies that that ETF um, holds. The challenge is though, and where you need to be careful is you need to look right here at expenses. Because when, once you start getting into ETFs, part of your investment is paying people to watch the stocks and move your money around for you. And so you can look here, like if you get into, depending on which ETF, they're going to charge you 0.12%, 0.1% of your money. This one charges you almost 1%, way too high. 
to manage your money. But if you don't know what you're doing and you're not confident enough to buy individual stocks, or maybe you don't have enough money to even buy a full share. Like if you were to ask me to buy one share of Google or, or, uh, or uh, um, what's another one, Google or Amazon, like I wouldn't buy just one share of that company. It's $3,000 a share. So an ETF, what that allows you to do is buy a, a little portion of some of these companies. So your one ETF is really stock in, you know, X amount of companies, but that's starting to get down a little bit deeper. What I want you guys to know is that it's important to get started. It's, it's go out and buy a 10 or $20 book of investing for dummies, a uh, stock market for dummies, investing. On, and I say dummies just because not that you're dummies, but it's a very simplified way of getting in. And then when you start learning about, you know, profit and, and, and earnings, P and E, which, um, uh, let me see if, if uh, one of these other pages, maybe I'll explain P and E very quickly. Because um, what you start learning is, hey, what is P, P to E? Uh, and I always call it profits to earning. I don't know if that's actually accurate. Um, half, the time, half the time, I make up my own stuff in my head because I he hear P to E, uh, yeah, price to earnings ratio. And so you start learning like, okay, what, how much, how, what is the value of the stock in the company versus the cost of the stock itself? Is it overvalued? Is it undervalued? Is it a good buy? You know, all these, all the, and again, I'm not telling you the right way to do this because I'm not smart on a lot of this stuff. But what I do know is that time is your friend and saving money so you, that you have cash on hand for six months to one year of your bills and that way, if you get a flat tire or that way you get fired from your job, you still have enough money for rent. You still have enough money for gas in your car. You have that safety cushion so you can look for another job or maybe move across the country to, to move for employment. Once you have that year's worth of safety net in savings, everything else that is disposable should be going towards investing. And, and so you have to pay yourself first in savings, then pay yourself next in investments. And then once you're doing that, then if you have a couple of bucks left aside, you can say, ah, you know what? I'm going to buy a video game or I'm going to go out to dinner or I'm going to go skiing this weekend or whatever. But you always got to tell yourself this $50 ski trip is equal to $1,500 or $2,000 when I'm retired. Now, depending on inflation, maybe that hundred or that $1,000 when you retire is only worth $50. But what it means is that you'll be able to um, have such a big safety net that you really can become a millionaire if you're young enough and you just put $50 a month plus the inflation, uh, which you know might be $100 a month by the time you're 30 and it might be $200 a month by the time you're 50. But if you put that aside, you can be just, you'll be a millionaire. Now, maybe that million because of inflation is only worth $500,000 today. Well, it's still $500,000 that you don't need to make that you don't need to be doing working a part-time job, working an additional job. And so when you get to be my age, and then I, I say, okay, I look at my investments and I decide to sell uh, some of this and some of this and some of this and purchase land and use some of this and some of this and some of this to have a house built on that land. I still have enough left over in that investment that it's still going to be making enough money. Now, I'm, I'm losing quite a bit of that money that's in my investments, but because I have land, because I have a property like a home, because I have a car that is paid off, I don't have any monthly outgo except for food, maybe some utilities and any fun I want to do. So then if I'm still working, I can put that two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 a month back into the market so that when I retire by 65, I've replaced everything I took out of there to buy a home because now I don't have rent that is twelve or $1,500 a month. Now I don't have a $500 a month car payment. That's $2,000 right there. And, and I know the money may be, may be more or less based on where you live, but that's $2,000 a month. I don't have to put into a car and, and, and a car is not going to last forever and put it into rent. Rents prices go up almost every year. But, but when I take that 2000 and put it back in to investing, well, I mean, let's look at that very quickly. Okay. Uh, we'll, Initial balance, let's start at zero. We'll do interest rate 10 again. Let's say I'm 50 and I want to retire by 65. That's 15 months or 15 years until I retire. And let's say I put in that $2,000 a month that I don't have to pay on rent and car payment anymore. We'll do all the math the same. 
increase payments with yearly inflation, 5% inflation rate. So how much money, if I put that $2,000 that I'm renting? Well, look at this. If I put that $2,000 a month that I'd normally be paying on rent and car payment, but I, I put it into investments because I have purchased a home, I've purchased land, I don't need to pay for those things. You know, I can, I can, I can keep my car decent and running for 15 years. That's not hard to do with modern cars. That means I'll, I'll have put in half a million dollars, but maybe that's what I took out for my property in my house, but I'll have free, free half a million dollars. So by the time I re retire at 65, I'm worth a million dollars again, which is more than I spent on the land in the house. So you young guys out there, that say, oh, I'm never gonna be able to own a home. Look at the prices of home and land. Everything's inflating and going super crazy. I'll never catch up. You can catch up. You just, instead of putting your $50 a month, you know, uh, instead of putting, say you're, say you're millennial or 25 or whatever, and you're gonna wanna buy a house at 45 years old. So that's 20 years of investing. And let's say that you put, uh, I don't know, $300 a month in there, even with inflation and everything else. Well, you, your deposit would have been 120,000. You'll have uh, made 200,000 free money. Now you have 325,000 and you say, yeah, but a new house, uh, it was uh, 200,000 when I started, now it's a million dollars. Okay, well now you've got 35% to put on that house. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily gonna I mean, but the housing market goes through these waves. If you look at the bubble that happened right before 2008, prices were astronomical. Then they fell off and they dropped by 30, 40, 50% in the markets. But if you're doing this, you have the money ready to go. And then you can look at the housing market and say, oh, this is way too expensive. I can't get in right now. Just wait, just wait. Now the stock market may fall off at the same time that the housing market falls off. Usually the market recovers faster than the housing market does. Interest rates, uh, right now interest rates, the feds are talking about increasing the interest rate. Well, if they increase the interest rate by a couple percentages, that means a mortgage on a house that might've been three and a half percent or five and a half percent, probably more realistically, um, uh, the interest rate on a home will be five and a half percent. Well, it might jump up to 8%. That is huge when it comes to your house payments. And that's huge when it comes to paying like the, the cost of your mortgage, where you'll be paying for a, a $300,000 house, but the total you will have paid back is three quarters of a million dollars because they're getting your 8% interest instead of the stock market paying you 8%. So what do you do instead of getting a mortgage? You, you, or, or you get the mortgage, right? When the interest rates are low and when they go up, then it's gonna be hard to purchase a house, to finance a house. But what if you're a joker? What if you've decided, you know what? I'm gonna live at home a little bit longer. I'm gonna live in a cheap apartment. Um, I'm gonna buy a little trailer and live somewhere. Well, the difference in that money you invest, and maybe you do that while you're in your 20s and your 30s, or even your 30s up until you're 40. I mean, I did not have a house at 40 years old, 43 years old. I built a bus to live out of. I lived with my family because my parents were, my father was ill, but I, I lived with my parents for three years to take care of them, to do projects around the house, but to save money. What did I do with it? I invested it. And so then when everybody's saying, oh, the interest rates are going up, the price of everything is going up. So people slow down on buying those houses because the interest rate is too much and they don't want, they can't or won't finance that much. So the housing market cools. Well, you've done a good job with your investing. So you pull it out of your investments, you pay tax on it, which is gonna hurt a lot. And then you go and you say, I wanna buy this house. The market's cool, the prices are lower. And you come in, bang, pay for that house in cash. Now that you have that house in cash, what do you do with the $1,500 or 2,000 that might've been a mortgage payment? You, you pay yourself with that. You become the landlord. You become the money maker. You put that back and reinvest it back into your stocks. And so over time, instead of the bank making half a million on your payments, you make a half million by investing it. So I hope this all makes sense. I know some of you financial gurus are probably pulling your hair out right now. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm being exactly right here. 
you know, but I'm trying to peak your brain a little bit and get you interested and start understanding this stuff because this, this, this is your level up. If you play video games or World of Warcraft or whatever else, this is leveling right here. This is hardcore leveling. It gets really addictive and really fun seeing your money making you money and you forget about it because you, in, you shouldn't look at this stuff daily, weekly, monthly, maybe look at it once a year if you're investing long-term and, and look at the stocks that you've invested in to know, hey, you know what, maybe I'm gonna change from this stock to this stock or this, you know, this company, they shouldn't have lost this much money, but a couple of bad stories came out in the news about them and they lost 20 or 30% of their stock, but they're still a good company. Maybe I'm gonna take some money from this other place and put it here. You wanna do that once a year, you know, maybe, maybe make some adjustments like that. And that's how I'm able to live comfortably. You know, if I lose my income now on YouTube or whatever else, I'll go back and work as a network engineer nine to five and keep pushing my money away into the bank. But the difference is because I did this really hard, like at some point in time uh, when I was doing successfully well as a, um, as a network engineer, there were times I was putting three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month into my investments. And what that allows me to do is then live off the dividends from that. So there you go, guys. I hope this helps a little bit. If you have any comments or corrections down below, like don't, don't take anything I'm saying for 100% uh, perfect. I'm just saying, get involved, learn this stuff, pay yourself, and eventually you'll be doing well enough that you don't even have to work. Your money will work for you and you can just sit back and relax and enjoy life. Guys, if you'd like to support my work, links are below as always. If you have, thank you very much. The best way you can support me is like, comment, share, subscribe, and join me over on betterbachelor.locals.com or um, rumble.com forward slash user slash betterbachelor.